This is the section on lubrication and ignition. If you have any questions as we're going along, asterisk them and give me a ring, give me a, an email. And if you, yeah, you do that. First off is lubrication. Why do we have a lubrication or an oil system on a jet engine? To reduce friction so the metal parts don't touch each other, otherwise we'd get a lot of heat. And to cool, there, though some of these metal parts are going to get hot even though the friction is low. So we're going to need to cool those parts off. There's three basic parts that uh, are going to need to have the friction kept down and to reduce the cooling. One of them is bearings, for instance. Here's a cutaway diagram of a TPE331 turboprop. It has a uh, gear reduction box and the accessory section all in one spot and you can bolt things onto the back of the accessory section but one could argue that this part right here is the propeller reduction in any case this engine has a lot of bearings here's the shaft you can see the main shaft of the engine comes into the propeller gear reduction and the accessory section and there's gears in here to slow things down and of course here's the output shaft for the propeller um, we need to keep the shaft in place so we're going to have to put something around it. We're going to put some bearings that go around it. Here's a set of bearings, here's a set of bearings, another set of bearings, another set of bearings, here's a set of bearings go around this shaft and here and here's the biggest ones right here. This is going to, you know, that's going to keep the propeller in place, keep the shaft from leaving the engine, keeps the shaft from going up and down left and right and it also bearings keep the shaft from going in or out too much and these bearings are going to have metal to metal contact so we need to pump some oil around it to make sure they don't get too hot here's a uh, Pratt & Whitney JT90 it was the first uh, engine they put on the 747-100 the 747-100 here's a bearing here's a bearing here's a bearing and I might not catch it seems like there ought to be more bearings but these go all the way around the shafts the spools and we're gonna pump oil to them and we're gonna pump oil out of them accessory sections here's a TPE 731 they make these at Honeywell International on the north end of Phoenix Sky Harbor Airport and here are the accessory sections the accessory section you bolt stuff on and you can bolt stuff on over here. Remember, it's this main shaft. We're going to take energy off of it by connecting another shaft. And the gears in here are going to have metal to metal contact, and they'll get too hot if we don't have oil. Here is a uh, T56 or an Allison 501. It's been bought by Rolls Royce. They put these on C 130s. A big, it's a big giant turbo prop here. It doesn't show up, but there's a shaft coming out and running this gearbox down here. And of course, you can bolt things on it. Doesn't have any accessories bolted to it right now. And of course, here you can see the propeller gear reduction box, which has lots and lots of gears. So we're going to be pumping oil to the accessory gearbox, and we're going to be pumping oil to uh, a reduction gearbox, whether it's a turbo prop or a turbo shaft engine. And then of course, here's another cutaway of the TPE 331 and you can see the gears inside of the reduction gearbox and on the back side of here which we can't see very well is the accessory section now what you do need to understand also is that this oil unlike unlike piston engines or reciprocating engines is not used to cool most of the engine a jet engine most of what cools it most of what cools it is the airflow that seventy percent cooling air coming through the core because of the the compressor seventy percent of the air in here is used for cooling and that does the vast majority of keeping the engine from getting too hot what we're worrying about are the bearings that are holding the shaft in place the gears inside of the accessory gearbox and if we have a reduction gearbox there's going to be gears in there so the three places we're looking at cooling with the oil are the bearings the accessory section parts and the gear reduction parts the cooling air which does most of the cooling in the engine that's goes through the engine 
and essentially does not cool the gearbox, the bearings, or the accessory section. There's two basic types of turbine oil. Both of them are synthetic, that is they are not made out of petroleum, they're not made out of hydrocarbons, and the biggest reason is that they need to have really high thermal stability. I'll get to that here in a moment. MIL-L, MIL stands for military specification, L is for lubrication. This is the 7,808th military specification that they made. There's still lots of engines out there that run off of 7808, it's also called Type 1. MIL-L-23699 is a newer jet engine oil. It's also called Type 2. Type 2 or 23699 has higher thermal stability. Higher thermal stability means that it doesn't break down into other chemicals and lose its characteristics even when it's exposed to really high temperatures for a long period of time. All jet engine oils we need to have high thermal stability. 23699 is just a little better than 7808. We also need oil that doesn't foam. If we have a reservoir and we're pumping oil back into it and it hits and it forms a bubble, that bubble needs to burst right away. Otherwise, we'd get lots of foam in here, and it would try to get bigger than the reservoir. Also, uh, it's possible that if we're maneuvering the engine a lot, and we're sucking oil out of the reservoir, we might suck a bubble into the oil pump. And the oil system is not designed to pump air. It's designed to pump fluid. So we need oil that doesn't foam. High viscosity index. Well, first, viscosity itself, viscosity is how easily a fluid moves, how easily it will pour. Low viscosity means it's thin and it pours easily. High viscosity means it's thick and it doesn't pour easily. Viscosity index is an indication of how much, how well it maintains its viscosity even though we heat it up or cool it down. High viscosity index is good because that means it does not change its viscosity very much even though it's cold or even though it's hot. So we could have, let our jet engine sit out on a cold day in winter and the fluid would still be thin enough, would still have a low enough viscosity that we could pump the fluid through the engine. But if it got really hot, like we're going to pump it past the uh, bearings in the turbine section, we're going to hit a couple hundred degrees Celsius probably of the oil and so we don't want it to get too thin otherwise it won't lubricate very well so we need a viscosity index that's very high that means the oil does not change its viscosity very much even when the oil gets hot turbine engine oil this synthetic oil is hygroscopic that means when it's exposed to the atmosphere it will absorb air so if you open a can of jet engine oil and you pour half of it out if this hole that you opened up in it isn't sealed off, water molecules will get in the oil. That's hygroscopic. That means it absorbs water molecules out of the air. It'll ruin the oil. So you either have to use it all, throw it away, or you need to seal it up, literally airtight, so no water or vapor molecules can get into it. Um, it's common for jet engine manufacturers, the manufacturers of the engine, to say don't mix brands of oil. If you're using Shell jet engine oil and you go somewhere and you need a quart, it's essentially saying don't put in Mobile or don't put in Exxon. So you might want to carry around an extra quarter of oil or two if you're flying corporate jets in case you land somewhere and they don't have the brand that you'd like. Some engines, they don't care. They won't say anything about it. But obviously, if it's in the pilot operating handbook, the approved flight manual, you've got to follow it. Um, there are some engines that specifically say you got to use 7808, some engines that say you got to use 23699, and I've seen a few engines that say you can use 20, you can use either one, and it may even say you can mix them, but if you do mix them, the 23699 is what's left in the engine is really only going to have as high a thermal stability as 7808. Um, the downside, one of the downsides of turbine oil is that if you leave it on paint and on some plastics,
uh, for a long time, not like five minutes or anything, days and days and days, it tends to eat it. So if you spill it on paint, you need to wash it off, not just wipe it off with a rag, but you need to wash it off with soap. And the same thing goes for human skin. It's not like it's going to be on there and 10 seconds later it's going to hurt. But if you left turban oil on your hands all day long, like two, three hours, like the length of a flight, uh, it's going to burn, kind of like a light sunburn. So I recommend highly that if you get turbine oil, engine oil on you, that you wash it off with soap and water. It's essentially the same as jet en- getting jet engine fuel on you. System characteristics. Um, unlike a piston engine here, you don't have to draw this on the test, but I'll go over it really fast. If you're looking at a piston engine in an airplane, there, uh, the oil deliberately gets splashed onto the side of the engine cylinder and some of this oil, even though there's an oil ring in here or two, keep trying to scrape the oil back into the engine, some of the oil gets into the combustion chamber and gets burned up and goes out with the exhaust. So reciprocating or piston engines, especially if they're air-cooled, tend to burn more oil. Jet engines, on the other hand, have a very low oil consumption rate because none of the oil is supposed to go into the combustion chamber. We're going to keep, you know, if we've got a jet engine and we've got some bearings holding on, we're going to have a case around the bearing and we're going to pump oil into it and we're going to pump oil out of it and we're going to have really nice seals so that the oil can't escape so none of the oil, or at least a very, 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 very small amount, get, doesn't get into the engine. So we're g- f- so for jet engines, especially per horsepower, jet engines have an amazingly low oil consumption compared to piston engines in airplanes. Um, usually the PSI is a little higher than that in piston engines. You know, it's probably around 100 PSI under normal conditions, whereas on reciprocating engines it's usually at around 50. Dry sump versus wet sump. Dry sump versus wet sump. Oops. Okay, if you look at the front or the back of a jet engine, you're going to notice, typically, that there's going to be an oil reservoir, and of course the cowling would go all the way around. And they tip commonly make it conformal to the side of the engine. Of course you can't see the oil tank, but it's external to the engine. It's external to the engine. If you look at a piston-powered airplane engine, the bottom part of the engine that's where the oil is. Literally, you squirt the oil out to the engine, and then gravity, you squirt the oil out to the engine, it may get scraped back, and then gravity puts it at the bottom of the engine. And so, literally, the crankshaft is rotating around in here, and just a couple of inches below it is the oil reservoir. This is called a wet sump engine. A wet sump engine is where literally the oil reservoir is inside of the engine, and the bottom of the engine is wet, hence the term wet sump. A dry sump engine is where the bottom of the engine is kept dry. If we look at that jet engine again, and we have these bearing chambers, there's no oil puddling down at the bottom of the engine. In fact, there isn't any sump on the inside of the engine. The sumps on the outside are actually going to pump the oil to the reservoir, so there's no oil in the bottom of the engine. The engine bottom of the engine is dry, hence the term dry sump. You're going to find that the vast majority of jet engines are dry sump, and in fact, if it's the engine that is propelling the aircraft, if it's the engine that's propelling the aircraft, it's going to have a dry sump. Most APUs have a dry sump, but there's a very, very few APUs that have a wet sump. What kind of components are in the lubrication system, in the oil system? Well, you're going to have a main engine-driven pump, a pressure pump. In fact, I like engine-driven pump better because it's bolted into the engine. So if the engine is spinning, the oil pump is spinning. Here's the oil coming in from the reservoir, and it's going to fill up this area in here. And since this gear is going this way, this gear is going this way, the oil gets trapped in here. The oil is trapped in here. And when the oil comes out here, when the gears come together, it forces the oil out. And this goes to the engine. 
and here we have a pressure relief valve. It's going to be set, say, at about 100 PSI, and you can see there's a spring around here. So when the PSI in here gets higher than 100, some of the oil will be allowed to go back to the beginning of the pump and just make a circular trip all the time so that the oil stays at about the same PSI. This is identical. This is identical to the theory of operation of a Cessna 172 0360 or a Seminole 0360 engine oil pump with a pressure regulating valve. You gotta have filters just in case. In fact, we'll see later there's lots of filters on jet engine oil systems. Um, the oil's gonna get hot. We're gonna pump oil past the bearings in the turbine section. Of course the turbine section is hot, so we're gonna need to get rid of that heat somewhere. So you can either have an oil cooler. An oil cooler essentially works the same as a radiator. You gotta blow air across it. Uh, a radiator in a car that is. You blow air across it and the fluid inside of it uh, gives the heat energy to the air and that air goes overboard. Problem with oil coolers is is let's say we got a jet engine and we look near the front of this jet engine and here's the cowling and we look and we see a little hole on the side you know six inches in diameter and that's an oil cooler it works really good but look at the drag that we're gonna have we're gonna slow the airplane down a little tiny bit so what you're gonna see on transport category jets are heat exchangers here is a heat exchanger we're gonna run a uh, heat exchanger we're gonna r exchange heat with the fuel so we're gonna have this essentially it's kinda like a tank here's the top view and we're gonna run fuel through a tube through a fluid line and the fuel is gonna get warmer and we're gonna run oil through I guess I could change colors here we're gonna run oil across these tubes here it doesn't work Let's see. can't see it very well but we're gonna run oil through these tubes across them so the oil cools down Oops. oil temp goes down and fuel temp goes up and of course we're going hey yeah that's cool man fuel temperature going up that way we don't have to worry so much about entrained water freezing and clogging things up and you'll notice in this uh, fuel oil heat exchanger there's a pressure relief valve right here if uh, if things get stuck if the oil trying to go in here can't get out then uh, the pressure in here will build up and it'll push against this spring and this valve will open so this is essentially the same uh, this is a bypass valve which if you look at piston powered airplanes and they have oil coolers which are really air oil oil air heat exchangers in case it gets clogged up you still want the oil to be able to move so there's typically there also a bypass valve so the theory of operation of that is the same gotta have fluid lines uh, unlike piston engines where most of the oil lines are on the inside of the engine in a jet engine you know if you look at the inside of a jet engine guess what there's all these rotating blades we can't run an oil line down through it because the blade will come by and chop it off so these oil lines are going to be on the outside of the engine if we look on the outside of the engine we're going to see oil lines going to and going from the parts on the engine so the fluid lines are, are on the outside and can typically be seen on a jet engine whereas reciprocating engines you typically can't see very many of them at all Bearings. I already talked about bearings. There's, they are what holds the shaft in place. There's a couple of different kinds of bearings. Let's say that here's the sh shaft or spool of the engine, and this part right here rotates with the engine. You know, there's a ball right here, and this part is stationary. And if this piece is hooked onto the engine part that rotates, if it tries to move, then the ball gets caught. So this a ball bearing keeps the engine from going forward and aft and it also keeps it from going up and down and left and right. A roller bearing on the other hand, here's the shaft. The roller bearing only keeps the the, the spool from going up and down and left and right. Uh, it can move in and out just a little bit. 
because we're going to have a coefficient. Whoops, whoops, I can't spell coefficient. of expansion. The shaft is going to be made out of metal. might be a hollow metal tube, but it's still going to be made out of metal, and it's going to tend to get longer. So this is going to have to be able to move back and forth a little tiny bit, but we still need a ball bearing in place to keep the shaft inside of the engine. Seals. There are two main kinds of seals. There's contact seals and labyrinth seals. Contact seals are pretty easy. So here's the shaft of the engine. And we've got, uh, let's say we've got a ball bearing system going on here. So this is all... I didn't know I could draw ball bearings. Learn something new every day. So we're going to need to squirt oil in here, but we don't want the oil leaking out to the rest of the engine. So we're going to put a box, a bearing chamber around it. And the problem is that there has to be a little gap. There has to be a little gap between the bearing chamber and the shaft. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to fill that up with a contact seal. It's made out of carbon. It's black. And that'll keep the metal of the bearing chamber from hitting the metal of the shaft. And of course, if we pump oil in, we're going to have to use a scavenge pump to, to pull the oil out, otherwise this would fill up with oil and sure enough the oil would leak out. So contact seals actually touch or make contact, hence the term contact seals, make contact with the rotating parts. Labyrinth oil seals on the other hand use a completely different method to keep the oil inside of the bearing chamber. So here's a ball bearing, here's our shaft. Here's our ball bearing here, here's our ball bearing there. They go all the way around the shaft, and here comes in oil from the oil pump. And it's going to come down, and we're going to suck it out with a scavenge pump. And instead of having contact seals, we're going to actually put around this bearing chamber, we're going to put another chamber. But inside of this chamber, we're going to blow in bleed air. It's going to be at a higher pressure. So the oil trying to get out of the bearing chamber is pushed back by the bleed air. This bleed air pushes backwards on the so that the oil can't get out, so that the oil is kept inside of the bearing chamber by bleed air pressure. Now, here is a little vent to let this bleed air go back and it's going to go to the reservoir or the fuel tank or the correction the oil tank to keep the oil tank pressurized and then of course we're going to let the oil out of the bottom with the scavenge pump this works out great we don't have anything touching anything I mean the bearings are touching but we don't have anything touching at the shaft so oil can't get out and as long as the engines running we'll have bleed air so this is an extremely common method of uh, an oil seal is a labyrinth oil seal. And of course I already told you we're going to have scavenge pumps since it's a dry sump engine we have to pump the oil from the engine back to the reservoir we can't just let gravity do it. So we're going to have uh, more than one scavenge pump. Here is a basic oil system. Here's our oil tank. Here's our main engine driven pump. It's going to pull the fluid in and it's going to squirt it. Here's our bearing chamber. It's going to squirt it onto the bearings. Now I really don't like this. There is not oil sitting in the bottom of this tank because we are sucking it out with a scavenge pump. And of course this p the pumps are bolted into the engine and spinning all the time. So it's going to pump the oil 
back to the oil tank and this doesn't show it very well but bleed air is coming in and blowing uh, bleed air into across the shaft into this oil chamber so that the oil can't get out and you can see there is this vent so that the bleed air goes back to the oil tank and this doesn't show up very well but there's a spring here so that if the pressure inside of the oil tank the air pressure because the bleed air gets too high it can push against this ball in this spring and get relieved since the uh, scavenge since the oil gets hotter and may expand wow there's that coefficient of expansion again if you add up the volume of all of the scavenge pumps it's going to be greater volume than the pressure pump and since some of this uh, bleed air that blows into the oil chamber might have a bubble or two yes we don't want it to foam at all but there might be a bubble or two uh, it, may ha it may have to pump a bubble or two so we need definitely the scavenge pumps to have a higher volume than the total of the pressure pump. Also, the oil pressure gauge inside of the airplane, since that reservoir is pressurized, since there's bleed air pressure, let's just say, you know what, let's go back. Let's just say this bleed air pressure in here is 50 PSIA, PSI uh, absolute, that is, it's 50 pounds per square inch above uh, a vacuum. And let's say this main pump can put out 150 PSI absolute. Then the oil squirting in here is going to come in at 150, but if this bleed air coming in is at 50 PSI, and of course some of it's going to be vented back to the reservoir, then it's 150 minus 50. We're going to get an actual differential of 100 PSI. So our gauge inside of the cockpit is going to read this differential. It's set up so that the gauge reads the output pressure of the pump minus the pressure that's actually inside of the oil chamber. The oil chamber is at 50 psi, so 50 minus 150 minus 50 is 100. So that's very typical on jet engines to have a pressurized oil tank, to have pressurized oil chambers so that the pressure in the cockpit really needs to be the differential pressure because that's going to be telling us how much oil is really getting there. It's the differential pressure. Typically on piston engines, on reciprocating engines, they're vented to the atmosphere so they're just telling you how much higher the pressure is above ambient. But since uh, jet engines, the oil tank and the oil chambers are pressurized by bleed air, we need the difference between the output pump, the main engine driven pump, versus the pressure in the oil chambers. And it is a differential pressure. And oil tank reservoir, already told you, it's typically on the side of the engine. Here's a bypass, high bypass turbofan. You can see that, uh, here's the bearings. Let's try green. Uh, what color should we use for bearings? Mm -hmm. Let's use pink. So here's some bearings here and right here. Here's some bearings, some bearings, some bearings. Here's some bearings, bearings, and bearings. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Looks like this engine has eight sets of bearings. The uh, red color is the engine-driven oil pressure. So it doesn't show it very well, but there's an oil tank out here. You notice it's not on the bottom of the engine. It's on the side. It's a dry sump oil tank. So this red oil, it's not red color, it's kind of clear, it gets pumped to these bearings. This thing right here is a filter. It gets pumped to these bearings. It doesn't show up, but there's probably a filter right here. Look, here's another filter to those, and here's another filter to there. It gets squirted on it, and it doesn't show them, but there are uh, scavenge pumps. And scavenge pumps are going to suck the oil out and pump it back scavenge pumps are going to suck the oil out and pump it back, scavenge pumps are going to suck the oil and pump it out and scavenge pumps are going to suck the oil and pump it out and the oil, depending on which, here's a return line that pumps it into the tank here's a bunch of return lines that pump it back into the tank
and you'll also see the blue here in this diagram it calls it vent air but I'd rather call it bleed air it doesn't show exactly where it's coming from but it's definitely coming from the compressor bleed air is going into this oil chamber this oil chamber this oil chamber and this oil chamber and of course these fluid lines either whether there's oil or bleed air in them you're going to be able to see those on the outside of the engine Here's a Pratt Whitney JT8D. This picture is in the Traeger, figure 15-23. And you can see the main pressure pump right here. This is the main pressure pump. Here is the oil tank. And it's going to pump oil out. Wow, look, here's a filter right away. There's a filter, and here's a bypass valve just in case the filter gets stuck. And here's the pressure regulating valve if the pressure in here gets too high. It'll just send the oil back to the inside main part of the, the entry entrance to the pump. So here's our main pressure. And here is an oil cooler. This is another this is the bypass valve. Oil typically doesn't go through it unless, you know, it could be uh, temperature sensitive. And well actually that would be a temperature controlling valve. Uh this doesn't show two different valves. Probably there's two. One to so the oil only goes through the cooler if the oil's hot, and then another one to bypass it in case it gets stuck. So oil goes through the oil cooler. Now we can pump oil to this bearing, to this bearing, 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 and this bearing. So here's the oil. Oh wait, check this out. There's a filter. Oil comes down and gets squirted to these places. Oh wait, there's a filter. And sure enough, here's a filter before it gets squirted to that bearing. Now here in this diagram, it's really easy to see. Here's a scavenge pump, here's a scavenge pump, here's a scavenge pump, here's a scavenge pump, and it's going to pump the oil. It doesn't show it very well. Back to the tank, it's going to pump the oil. It doesn't show it very well. Back to the tank. And here is the accessory gearbox. It even has a scavenge pump to pump oil back to the reservoir. Chip detectors. If you look out at the bottom of an accessory gearbox, there's probably going to be a chip detector. That chip detector is hooked up to a light in the cockpit. And if a small piece of metal off of one of these gears, you know, one of these gears, a small piece of metal falls off and touches this chip detector, then the light illuminates. And in the cockpit, you go, ah! And you think, hey, something inside of the engine is coming apart and you're typically going to find chip detectors in three places at the bottom of the oil reservoir you're going to find it at the bottom of the accessory section and you're going to find it inside of the gear reduction box or the reduction gearbox if you prefer and because these the accessory section and the gear reduction section have a lot of gears in them so that's a more likely place for these particles to uh, fall down to and of course the oil reservoir that's where the oil is coming back from the bearings inside of the engine and it depends on the aircraft uh, as to what you need to do in case this light comes on it may say land as soon as possible go ahead and finish your flight um, it depends on the aircraft and of course on helicopters they'll also put chip detectors in the bottom of the transmission for the rotor blades even a Robinson R22 helicopter has a chip detector in the main rotor and there's a chip detector in the tail rotor gearboxes if you have any questions about lubrication you know how to get a hold of me if you have any suggestions on how better to do this lecture please let me know and now ignition systems what is the point why do we have ignition systems on jet engines well the most important reason is so we can get the engine started we've got to catch the fuel on fire in the first place now the good thing is once we get it caught on fire uh, we don't need the ignition very often but it's pretty important you cannot take a big lighter and wave to the pilot and have them spin up the jet engine and turn on the fuel and light the engine with a big lighter at the tailpipe of the engine uh, you gotta have an ignition source inside of the combustion chamber to get it started now there are some certain flight situations where it's possible that the combustion might uh, 
stop. You might have a flame out, and we'll talk about that later. So we also want to have an ignition system that we can turn on in flight in advance of the engine flaming out so that it won't have a flame out. So if there is a momentary occurrence where the flame stops burning, the ignition, if it's already on, will catch the fuel on fire immediately and will have no significant loss of thrust or horsepower. And of course, if for some reason the engine does flame out in flight, uh, we want to be able to get it started again, so we would definitely want to have an ignition system to be able to get the combustion occurring once again. So there's three good reasons why we need ignition systems. Now, like I said a minute ago, once we get the fuel combustion, the, the fuel burning, we have the combustion process running, you can turn the ignition off. In fact, during engine start, uh, as soon as you get the fuel caught on fire, you could turn the ignition off. We're usually busy doing other things, and we'll talk about that more when we get to the chapter on starting. Um, but most of the time, you, you have the ignition off. It's like a candle. If you don't blow too hard on the candle, the candle keeps burning. That is, it heats up the fuel, the wax, and turns it into a vaporous state so that it can catch on fire and the heat from the combustion of the previous wax burned melts the next set of wax and it gets it to evaporate. So the same thing in a jet engine is once we get it going it's self-sustaining and most of the time we don't need to run the ignition system. There are two basic types of ignition systems. The vast majority, vast majority of jet engines use the capacitor discharge system which I'll explain here momentarily. But there is one engine, the Pratt & Whitney PT-6 a Pratt & Whitney PT-6. Which, in addition to having a capacitor discharge, also has a glow plug. If you've ever taken a cigarette lighter and plugged it in and waited till it popped out, you'd notice there was that coil in there that was really red hot. That's a glow plug. So on a PT-6 inside of that combustion chamber, if here's the combustion chamber and we've got a fuel nozzle, they're going to have the igniter sticking in there and they're also going to have that coil, that glow plug sticking in the engine so that it will uh, heat up the, the fuel and make it evaporate better because you remember you gotta have the fuel in a vaporous state before you can catch it on fires so that's why you gotta atomize it and squirt it out into little globules so it'll evaporate easier and catch on fire. But the PT-6 is the only one that also, in addition to having capacitor discharge system, also has a glow plug. Okay, characteristics of capacitor discharge systems. Really high volts, really high amps, it's so the spark is much, much hotter than spark plugs. Gasoline evaporates very easily, so lots of the fuel is evaporated during engine start and so you don't need a very hot spark to catch the gasoline vapor and oxygen on fire but jet fuel is made out of diesel and it does not evaporate nearly as well at typical engine start temperatures so you need a hotter spark just to get some of the fuel to evaporate so once it's evaporated it can catch on fire and in fact there's so much energy in this igniter uh, discharging that it could, if it discharged through you and went through your heart, it could actually stop your heart from running. And I personally don't like when my heart stops operating. What components will you find in an ignition system? Well, there are three basic components. Whoops. Three basic components. You find the exciter box. and the ignition cables. And the exciters. Correction. Yeah, exciters. I'm igniters. Watch out, igniters is with an E and ignition is I-O-N. Um, you feed aircraft electrical system power and it converts this voltage into really high volts, really high amps, runs it out through the cables. And then we get a spark right here. These are not spark plugs. Spark plugs are found on piston engines. 
igniters are found on jet engines and there's two igniters here typically this exciter box has two different systems in it so if one fails uh, the other half will still work and still get at least one of the igniters running on some smaller engines there's just one igniter okay here is <clears throat> excuse me here is uh, the inside you don't have to draw, draw this you don't have to write it down if we run some electricity in there's going to be a step up transformer that makes the volts go up we're going to have some capacitors in here these flat lines these flat these are uh, stored these capacitors store electrical power and then they'll discharge really really fast we'll discharge them through another step up transformer and the volts will go even higher and then we'll run it out towards the exciter or the igniter rather and then this process will start all over again so this is going to charge up it'll take us you know half of a second or a second and then it'll discharge and of course it's hooked up to the electricity all the time it'll charge up and then discharge charge up and then discharge charge up and then discharge during start I mentioned it earlier <clears throat> excuse me that uh, once we get the fuel caught on fire we could turn the ignition off so letting it run for a second or two would be enough but typically uh, during the engine start you're busy looking at other things paying attention to other things sometimes the ignition actually it's commonly the ignition is uh, in the same circuit as the starter motor so as long as the starter motor is running the ignition is on so it typically runs longer than one or two seconds but you only need it for one or two seconds duty cycle that uh, igniter exciter box rather this exciter box it's got a lot of electricity going through it so it gets hot and the duty cycle is actually protecting the exciter box that's the part that's going to get hot so what a duty cycle means is that if you run it for a certain length of time you have to stop using it and let it cool down so that it uh, doesn't overheat and melt and get damaged so you might if you look in the pilot operating handbook it might say uh, 30 seconds on 30 seconds off 30 seconds on and then 30 minutes off so if you try a couple of starting sequences and you can't get it done you may have to wait for a while before you can run the ignition again otherwise that exciter box is going to get too hot now there are some circumstances where you're going to want to leave the ignition system on now typically the spark rate when you go to continuous is about half of normal so during start the uh, ignition might go click 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 it might be every second or so the spark rate under continuous it might be half that it might be every couple of seconds it might go click 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 so the spark rate under continuous is typically slower and uh, we don't have the same duty cycle constraints if we have this engine and we have the exciter box bolted onto the side of the engine you gotta understand that there are going to be a few holes in the cowling so uh, air can come in and cool things down especially things bolted onto the gearbox and so if you're not moving there's no airflow through the inside of the cowling and so the exciter box can't get cooled but if you're in flight cold air is going to go across it and so you can run it continuously and not have to worry about it getting too hot so that combined with the spark rate typically being a little less keeps the exciter box from getting too hot the question is when are these four times where you might want to run the ignition continuously well <clears throat> first of all take off and landing the, the the closer you are to the ground the less fun you're gonna have if the engine quits it's not that it's likely to quit but if there was a time you wanted it to not quit that would be it so take off and landing there are some engines where it'll say before takeoff checklist turn the ignition to continuous and then of course it'll turn it off after you land and then during the approach before you come in and land it'll say turn the ignition to uh, continuous um, second place would be heavy precipitation <clears throat> 
Um, that includes a lot of rain, a lot of snow, a lot of sleet, a lot of hail. It's possible that you could ingest enough water, which by the time the snow, sleet, or hail gets through the compressor section, it's going to be water. It might blow the flame out. It might, you know, it's like throwing a glass of water on a candle. Uh, so if that did occur and it blew, it, we had a flame out, then it would turn the, uh, it would catch the fuel on fire right away and the engine wouldn't slow down. It would actually prevent a full blown flame out. Third time would be severe turbulence. Severe turbulence. If we're flying through an updraft or a downdraft and the airflow across the front of the engine uh, gets messed up, then we can't get as much air coming into the engine. Well, even if we're still squirting fuel in there, if there's no air, it can't burn if, the, if we don't have enough air. So if we disrupt the airflow going into the engine bad enough, it's not common, but it's possible, then the fuel won't stay burning. So hopefully we fly through this turbulent air right away and a second or two later if we have the the ignition to continuous it'll catch the uh, fuel on fire again and we didn't have to do anything about it so we might have only lost power for one or two or three seconds and it catches the combustion chamber fuel air mixture back on fire again and we're really really happy so if we're in heavy severe turbulence we're probably going to turn on the ignition to continuous and then let's see number four Oh yeah, just prior to using anti-ice. And this would be engine anti-ice. If we have to turn on the anti-ice, then something that we need to be concerned about is ice sticking to the inside of the intake and to that bullet out here in front of the engine. So if we turn it on and there was some ice out there and it gets sucked into the engine, it's going to melt and we're going to have water and it might blow out the combustion. So before we turn on the engine anti-ice, we're going to turn on the ignition to continuous. There's a lot of airplanes where it's automatically done when you turn on the engine anti-ice it turns on the ignition on to continuous so you don't have to remember but some airplanes you do have to remember. There are also some aircraft that have auto ignition that is they're measuring uh, the most likely place you'll find this would be on a helicopter or a turboprop that's measuring torque. We've got some output shaft and let's say it's on a turboprop but this would be the same for a turbo shaft engine normally the propeller is taking torque and blowing air aft so if we've got a sensor in here measuring the fact that power is going to the output shaft we have positive torque but if the engine had a flame out or for some reason the engine wasn't producing power anymore then the, the air going through the propeller would be windmilling the engine and power would actually be going from the propeller to the engine, hence the term negative torque. And that would be hooked up with a switch to turn on the exciter box and turn on the ignition to try to light the flame back on fire, uh, which if this occurs it'll be a lot faster done by an automatic system than you trying to figure it out. Here's another example. Let's say you're in a helicopter and you're in a hover and you've got your turbine engine here driving your transmission and you're like 50 feet off the ground and if the engine quits you're going to go down and it's going to hurt. If you have an auto ignition system and you have it armed if the engine flames out for some reason and this you start to fall if it catches the fuel back on fire again within a second or two then you won't fall all the way down to hit the ground so it's very common to see an auto ignition system on a helicopter and have it turned on all the time. If you have any questions about ignition systems, please get a hold of me. If you have any suggestions on how to make this lecture better, please get a hold of me.